Jug with a 49-15 victory over the Minnesota Golden Gophers up at the Metrodome in Minneapolis. And Coach Schembechler, it was a 49-15 win. He had a sluggish start. It looked like in the first quarter that game, uh, Michigan was uh, left back in Ann Arbor. <laughs> well, typically, uh, we kicked off, and, um, and uh, they marched right down the field and scored. And uh, then once we moved to football, we went down and scored. However, we were called for holding, then went for a field goal and missed our first field goal of the year. So it was one of those first quarters when uh, you figured, I hope we wake up before this game is over. It was a tough game to play, too, because of the fact you had an emotional game the week before, an right. emotional game coming up, right. you were on the road. Those things all played into that, didn't it? It's very difficult uh, to play this game. Um, it was a tough week of practice. Uh, it's tough to sell them on the fact that this could be a tough game. I was very apprehensive about Minnesota because I felt they were capable of beating us. Since they've already done it twice in uh, my career. Anyway. Right. There's the little brown jug. It was ready to go. And on their first drive, it looked like they would beat you. Right. Schaffner passes out here to strain the big tight end. And um, they went to the corners a little bit, threw some out cuts. And then this bootleg pass, and we had him sacked. And he threw the ball off balance. Uh, but completed it clear down to our 26-yard line. And this really is the best their offense has looked in quite some time. That's right. And, uh, of course, the great back, uh, Daryl Thompson, ran for about five or six and then banged in for the score. I don't know. They went 76 yards or something like that and it looked kind of easy. five minutes. Yeah, it looked kind of easy. It looked uh, kind of easy. That had to worry you a little. This is Tony Bowles' first carry of the game. Breaks out for 17 yards, uh, gets into Minnesota territory, and got hit right here. Um, and hurt his right knee. Uh, the knee's being examined there by the doctors, and we don't know how bad it is, but he's out of the game for good. Uh, Michael Taylor comes back. He hits Greg McMurtry for a touchdown. Unfortunately, we were called for holding. Uh, after the penalty, we went to the field goal, and uh, J.D. Carlson missed his first field goal of the year, and so we're still trailing seven to nothing. And you're trying to find the alarm clock. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we gotta get up here, get going. Uh, Taylor goes back to pass, hits McMurtry at the 30. The pass was there, and that's what really got you started. The pass got us going. Of course, we started the game with three passes unsuccessfully. Here he throws back to Chris Calloway, and uh, we're across midfield here real fast. A bootleg pass, Mike puts it up in the air. It's a little bit short, and uh, Greg was wide open early, and he took the ball away from two Minnesota defenders uh, for our first score. And, made it 7-7. And that's in the second quarter. And now your special teams come in and again, give you a boost and help wake you up. Gave us a break here. Herbal, the Minnesota punter, uh, uh, punted this ball. And of course, uh, we've been working hard on our returns and Trip Wellborn's a good return man. Got it out to the 40 and we're on our way again. Did you know going into the game, the pass was gonna be big yes. for you? Yes, they've been passed on for over 200 yards a game, uh, average, and we thought we could throw on them. And we went to the pass here. Uh, Leroy Horde bangs inside the 30. Uh, we ran the ball pretty decently, uh, but our passing game really got us started and made the big plays. Here he rifles on a crossing pattern to uh, Greg McMurtry, and Greg runs it in for a touchdown. His second actually scored three. One was called back. This is his second of the quarter. And that makes it 14-7, and then Minnesota comes back, but the defense started to stiffen. Did you Started to play a little bit, started to put a little more pressure on the quarterback. Here he looked like he fumbled the ball, but the official said that he passed it. Finally get the ball back at the 30. Here Leroy Horde goes ripping off tackle and goes in standing up for the third touchdown to make it 21-7. to At that point, you gotta figure, okay, we're starting to get back in it a little That's bit right. mentally, I think. We're playing pretty well now. Um, just before the half, this is a three-play drive for a touchdown, a 28-yard run uh, by Leroy Horde. Stops the clock with a minute left. Uh, Mike goes back to pass, and uh, we had receivers open all day here at Callaway, right, right over the middle uh, with a big gainer. Uh, Mike comes right back. This is a third play of the drive just before the half, and he hits McMurtry on the corner route. who goes into the end zone for the touchdown and uh, we're up 28 to 7. 28 points in the second quarter. It looked like Michael looked left and looked that defense I off so, McMurtry. 
You can't throw those passes if you don't look them off. Uh, was it a reason that he, he went to McMurtry more often than Callaway? Callaway didn't get the touchdowns. McMurtry got three. Well, the next time it'll probably be Callaway instead of <laughs> McMurtry. It just depends. You know, whoever's open on the routes and he goes to him. Whatever Mike's reads are. Mike's good at reading the secondaries and knowing where to throw the ball. He doesn't make very many mistakes in that. We'll be back and we'll take a look at the second half highlights. But first, we'll hear from Greg McMurtry, who talks about the Wolverines' slow start against Minnesota. Hey, we came out a little sluggish, and uh, I think uh, everyone realized that, you know, hey, we can't let this one slip away. And, uh, and we turned around uh, in the second quarter and, and uh, started playing the way we had to play. We basically you know, just took the passes when they gave it to us, and uh, that was a lot of times uh, today. And uh, we got some big plays, and uh, Mike was throwing exceptionally well today. And uh, we, we just fortunately, you know, we came out with some big plays, like I said, and uh, you know, came out with a big victory. Well, the Wolverines certainly woke up. Mike Evans had a lot to do with that in the second half, the second quarter, actually. And uh, going into that second half with the big 28-7 to lead, I know you sometimes don't like that kind of situation, <laughs> yeah, but right. you had to be delighted with the way the team responded with their first possession in that second half because right. it was like the game was on the line. Well, once we got to football in uh, the second half, uh, we moved it, Jim. And that was critical. If you're going to take control of the game, you have to do that. Here, uh, Leroy Horde uh, runs in his first drive, picks up seven yards. Unfortunately, got injured at that time and left the game. Um, Gerard Bunch, the fullback, bangs in there for a first down. Uh, Alan Jefferson is now in at tailback. Skirts left end uh, with good speed, picks up uh, good yardage. Uh, close to a first down. Here's a third and three. Uh, Mike goes back to pass, uh, finds McMurtry over the middle again. Uh, for a big gain, and uh, that route had been real good for it. Rolls out here on first down at the three-yard line and hits Jefferson in the corner for a touchdown. So uh, we took the ball on the second-half kickoff, went down to score to make it 35-7. to seven. Four touchdown passes in the game for Michael Taylor, ties a Michigan record, and then they start to come back with their young quarterback. Well, they got field position on us here at the 38-yard line and threw over the middle of their tight end again and got down in there close. We had a fourth down and one. They ran the option play uh, with Fleetwood in at quarterback now and he picked up a first down. And then uh, finally, uh, Fleetwood went in for the touchdown on the option. They went for the two-point play and got it as he scrambled in for the touchdown. So it's 35 to 15. The one thing you did do in the second half, and here's an indication, is the pass was still there, and yet you went ahead and banged away with the run. We uh, ran the football quite a bit. Uh, this is Jefferson on another good run. He came in and, um, when uh, Horde got hurt and was a third tailback and did a remarkably good job. Uh, Mike comes out here and throws to uh, Callaway for a first down, and uh, we're moving the ball real well, Jim. Third and six, gives the ball to uh, Allen Jefferson, who breaks outside, bangs into the end zone for a touchdown, and it's 42 to 15. And again, that had to be another drive that you know you were very pleased with because this game, while it had gotten away a little bit, you guys were still playing and concentrating hard. Oh yeah, we were working hard and doing a good job. Uh, Jefferson here in the wishbone. Um, we have John Vaughn in here at tailback now, young redshirt freshman, and he runs past the 30 for another first down. Maybe a little look at the future? Well, give him a chance to play here. Uh, here, uh, Elvis Gerbeck uh, hits Desmond Howard. That's St. Joe High School in Cleveland to St. Joe High School in Cleveland for a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> Big win for you. You win the brown jug, you take it home, and that's important. A lot of people have lost the, I guess, the tradition of the brown jug, and yet you really realize how important it is when you lose it, I think. That's right. You never really uh, realize um, uh, until somebody comes over and takes it after they've beaten you. Uh, then you find out that these trophies do mean something. <laughs> and, you know, uh, the little brown jug is the oldest trophy, I think, of uh, any in the country uh, played between two schools. And uh, we've been fortunate to keep it here most of the time. Overall, other than the first quarter, you had to be real pleased with the performance of the club, especially in a tough situation with that emotional game behind you with Illinois, the one coming up. They had to respond on the road, and I thought they did a good job. They did, and, uh, and you know, I'm pleased that we won the game and uh, how we won it. Uh, of course, we slow started again. I don't like that. And I don't like the fact that uh, our first two running backs are, uh, you know, banged up right now. 
Um, hopefully we'll have him back. I really won't know that until later in the week. The other problems that you've had earlier in the season, it appears as though the kicking game is coming around. I mean, the, the placement game has been good with Carlson doing the job. The punting game seems Stapleton's getting things going a little bit better. Well, we're a little better. We're doing a better job there. We're covering better. Uh, we had a great punt return, which was good. Uh, kickoff returns, I think we could do a little better job. But uh, taking everything into consideration, it was a good victory for us in preparation for the big one coming up. Well, we'll be back and we'll take a look at a historical win by Michigan. We'll go back 20 years, maybe the biggest win in Bo's career. That's when we return. Well, I think it's kind of like your first bicycle. You always remember that first one. You're happy and glad every time you get a new one or a new car. You always are happy, but you remember that first one a little bit more. And I think this was the first big victory we had here at Michigan. Twenty years ago this week, one of the most memorable events in Michigan football history took place. The Ohio State Buckeyes, ranked number one in the country for two straight years and led by the legendary Woody Hayes, rolled into Ann Arbor as two-and-a-half touchdown favorites to beat Michigan. But a first-year coach named Shem Beckler had the Wolverines primed and ready. Michigan upset Ohio State 24-12 and shocked the football world. Even Coach Hayes admitted on the home video the 10-year war, Michigan's victory was no fluke. But they beat the greatest team that ever stepped on a college football field. I don't think there's any question about our 69 team. And I don't say that with bias. We were so far ahead in the national polls when we went up there, it wasn't even close. The game itself saw Wolverine Barry Pearson emerge as the hero. He intercepted three Ohio State passes and returned a punt to the Buckeye goal line. From a player's perspective, matching Ohio State play for play made the difference. We didn't let them get away with anything, so, you know, they didn't put two on the board and then you're behind trying to play catch up, but we scored, they scored, we scored, and then we scored again. And, and like I said, the, the big thing was the interceptions and the, and the punt returns that, that put us down in a position where we could just uh, get on top of it. And now, you know, once we got on top, it was, hey, you know, we got something going here. And there it is, what has to be the upset of the century. As the euphoria following the upset win spread across Ann Arbor, the impact of the victory had not yet been realized. Two assistant coaches who still work with Bo on his staff enjoyed that moment with the rest of the Michigan family. And they've also had 20 years to reflect on what that one game meant to the Michigan program. A lot more pressure on us. Uh, expectations become so much greater so much quicker because we were able to win that game and go to the Rose Bowl the first year. And so ever since that time now, we've been expected to compete every year, uh, never have a letdown, uh, always be on top. And so it's put added pressure on everybody and particularly on the kids. Oh, it just, it's like any business, it gives you instant credibility. I mean, you know, you got a great program to begin with because you got the University of Michigan, you got a lot of good kids here, and then you beat Ohio State. At that time, maybe the best team in college football ever. Replay. With both emotional game coming up, right. you were on the road. Those things all played into that, didn't it? It's very difficult uh, to play this game. Um, it was a tough week of practice. Uh, it's tough to sell them on the fact that this could be a tough game. I was very apprehensive about Minnesota because I felt they were capable of beating us. Since they've already done it twice in uh, my career. Anyway. Right. There's the little brown jug. And scored. And uh, then once we moved to football, we went down and scored. However, we were called for holding, then went for a field goal and missed our first field goal of the year. So it was one of those first quarters when uh, you figured, I hope we wake up before this game is over. It was a tough game to play, too, because of the fact you had an emotional game the week before and amazing right. it was ready to go. And on their first drive, it looked like they would beat you. Right. Schaffner passes out here to strain the big tight end. And um, they went to the corners a little bit, threw some outcuts, and then this bootleg pass, and we had him sacked, and he threw the ball off balance, uh, but completed it clear down to our 26-yard line. And this really is the best their offense has looked in quite some time. That's right. And Jug with a 49-15 victory over the Minnesota Golden Gophers up at the Metrodome in Minneapolis. And Coach Schembechler, 
It was a 49-15 win. He had a sluggish start. It looked like in the first quarter that game, uh, Michigan was uh, left back in Ann Arbor. <laughs> well, typically, uh, we kicked off, and, um, and uh, they marched right down the field. And, uh, of course, the great back, uh, Daryl Thompson, ran for about five or six and then banged in for the score. I don't know. They went 76 yards or something like that. And it looked kind of easy. Five minutes. Yeah, it looked kind of easy. It looked uh, kind of easy. That had to worry you a little. This is Tony Bowles' first carry of the game. Breaks out for 17 yards, uh, gets into Minnesota territory, and got hit right 